So I have colleagues that are interested in football, and that's how life is. So we can conclude so far, if you want to develop, you need to trade. If you want to trade, you need the money. If you want to get access to the money, you need the financial institutions. You can still survive by international lending or international investments, but you need money. And that is the problem. So the problem for a country that is developing is it has to be what we call credible, which simply means somebody are willing to lend you money or invest into your country. So it has to guarantee that if they put money into your economy, either by lending or by equity financing, you are guaranteed that your money won't disappear. Fraud is it's not French because then I think it's freezing, isn't it? But it's almost like that. Fraud simply means you cannot trust it. It's like playing poker with one with five S's or an extra joker in their arm. They pick it up uh, when they need it. So that is that. Bribery simply means you are in a corrupt country, you can bribe somebody. So you pay somebody to get a contract. So bribery and corruption is two sides of the same problem. Bribe is the one who pays, corrupt is the one that receives it. The solution might be reforms. The newly industrial country was based upon reforms of their economy. If you ask me what happened in China, I think the answer is reform. 1979, I think, Deng Xiaoping, which is not a speed skater from Eastern China, but he was never chairman but he uh, had control over the Communist Party after Mao's death. And he changed the system. If you ask a Chinese if it's a capitalistic system, I think they would object. They would even try to beat you if you try to argue. But if you ask me, and there are no Chinese watching us now, I think the answer is in a capitalistic system direction. So reforms are needed, but I think the major element is you have to involve more in the economy should you de develop. So it simply means those living in Western China are now integrated into the producing economy. So it's like selling cheese from a farm, then you are part of a trade, but for most Chinese, cheese is not important, so you have to move them from west to east, so they produce something else than cheese. Uh, I don't know if Chinese cheese is good, but it sounds like a very good selling concept. Have you tried our Chinese cheese? And since no one have heard of it before, all will come and test it out. And since there are 1.4 billion to buy it, you need not earn too much on each of them. Let's say you earn a euro per cheese you sell, and all of a sudden you are rich. So yes, it could work. OK. The textbook uses Latin America. And the problem for Latin America was strong and lasting inflation. They could never cope with, let's say, the amount of money and the number of products for sale. So their problem was simply too fast growing price level. <coughs> if you are in US, they have only two neighbors, Canada or Mexico. Why don't they 
talk so much about Canada when it comes to development, you might realize one day if you go there or if you have French cousins over there, I can tell you. So Mexico is obviously a developing country. It's the nearest neighbor to US, which is a developing country. And their problems could be solved with a trade agreement with US. But if Krugman is not listening right now, I think they sell too much drug in addition. But that is a problem for them. Okay. Why has Asia been a success? And why can there be a crisis in Asia? It's very simple to answer. Why has it been a success is this. Out of the formal economy into the formal economy has created the success. More and more contribute to the economy. So that is why it has been a success. Why can it be a crisis? Is if you are from the West and want an apartment in the East and it takes you more than 100 years to earn money to do it. What are the chances to be successful if you start your work when you are 12 and it takes you 100 years? I think it's quite slim, isn't it? So that is the other problem. Because of raising income in a small part of the population, they raise the level of buying houses. The houses that you need to buy are in the industrial sector. You come from the non-industrial sector and earn too little money to live out there. Okay, then you can say high-speed trains so you can get quick home. I think the distance is much longer than it is from Paris to Lyon. So it takes uh, quite a lot of time to get there if you want to get home. So commuting is not the answer to it. So yes, there are potential for growth up to a certain point. But since the growth is uneven, distributed, it can also cause crisis. You know what a local subsidiary is? Don't know of any. Okay? And not the Norwegian either. Do you know who owns the shipyard in the municipality where I live? Which once was called Eukrabruk an Italian company. So then this is a daughter company to the Italian mother company. So that is a subsidiary. It's simply the daughter company of a bigger firm. So multinational companies can have direct investment into developing economy that can help develop. But very often it has to have a local link and then you need what we call domestic entrepreneurs. What do they look like? Here they look like furniture producers. They used to be the domestic entrepreneurs. Most of the Norwegian industry developed around small places where like furniture clothing, things like that. But the growth of the Norwegian economy was based upon British and French money. You didn't know that. Okay, make room for the last drawing this week. Does this look like a mountain? Let's call it Mount Norway. Down from here runs water and we call it a waterfall. When you don't have the money to develop this into electricity, you call London. You place a firm down here that produce uh, <coughs> fertilizer and you call Paris. This is then called Hydro, which is the company, and this is called Energy Production Plants.
by British money or French money. So normally countries like us develop thanks to foreign direct investment. So if you ask Norwegian what could be one answer to it, thanks to France, but I think there are more British money into it than it was French, but, but, but you, you certainly contribute to the system. Domestic entrepreneurs in Norway were called Samaida. What was his idea? It was putting electricity to two points, and in between was air, and out of the air you took nitrogen. What do you do nitrogen for? Fertilizer. And it's a plenty of it in the air. I think it's 80%, isn't it? Or close to. So if you are looking for nitrogen, look into the air. There are no other places where there, this is. And this domestic Norwegian entrepreneur decided to come up with the technology that could produce nitrogen from air. If you look around, there's a lot of air in Norway. Since there are so few of us, there's a lot of free air in Norway too. But no money, so we needed French money. So yes, international money into a domestic production, probably by a domestic entrepreneur, and here we go. <coughs> it helps, but it's not a single answer. So then we con con conclude the major weaknesses is the growth by using more inputs. There is no sign of reducing the technology gap, simply because the new technology in the most advanced countries are developing as fast as ever. Three, if you do not have a bank system that is working, call Iceland, and then you will t they will tell you what is an inefficient banking system. It has to be sufficient and efficient. So most of the problem is like Iceland. So Iceland is in fact a developing country when it comes to banking system. Probably they have developed enough. But since you have been there, they probably have learned a lot the last two weeks. So now they know the answer. Okay. But the major problem, according to Krugman, is you need foreign direct investments. Then you need a law system that can handle problems that might rise when you, let's say, operate a firm. Let's call it in Uganda. So we drop Congo and move further up north. What happens if you run into problems in Uganda? Well, if it has a legal working system, it can be operated like the American system. So if there is a, let's say, dispute between the company and local uh, the authorities, put it into a court, let them decide, and let this legal framework be stable and, let's say, foreseeable and forecast. So yes, we need a system around production that guarantee that working on the production system. Okay? So as soon as they call from Uganda, you know, and say, could you come and help us out? Because now we want to be very serious about our, let's say, uh, using resources to develop. Then you point out, I have four points. The most important one is get a legal structure around production that guarantee that system can operate. Okay. What happened in South Korea when they got so-called newly industrialized? Well, simply more education, labor shift to industry, and they increase the cap capital labor ratio. So there are more capital behind each uh, worker in the economy. It simply means you need more money. And soon we are at the end, aren't we? Yes. Have you experienced moral hazard? Do you know what it is? 
None of you plays poker. No. But American bank stars. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Moral hazard simply means that there can be a fraud, and they can cut and get away from it. So moral hazard is simply because if they fool you, they don't get caught. That is moral hazard. So they can gain by, let's say, fraud. And that is the problem. So that was the fifth point on your piece of paper. Avoid moral hazard. Extensive lending means that you are lending too much money. If you lend too much money, it's like going to Iceland twice a week. And when you should repay this, you're out of money. That is what we call extensive lending. You lend too much. And if we cannot trust that you pay it back, we pick you up on the next flight to Iceland and fly you back home to get, uh, let's say, support from home that guarantee that you will pay this back. But that is hard to do if it's a country. This sounds like Russia, doesn't it? Yeltsin in 1991. Have you heard about oligarchs? Do you know who they were? Have you met any of them? Okay, go to London and see Chelsea play at home. There is one of them, Abramovich. What were, let's say, the major feature about them were they were male, they were young, and they had been members of the young communists in Russia. Why did they get all these money? And they had a bank. What you needed when you took over the companies that were state-owned before Yeltsin, now privatized, you needed a bank. So next time there is a president like Yeltsin in a country with a lot of nationalized industry, bring with you your local bank and then you will be an oligarch. But don't buy Chelsea, promise me that. Try to buy Borussia Dortmund instead. No. Okay. Stuttgart? That's better. Okay. Augsburg? Augsburg? That's better. Okay, then we buy Augsburg, yeah. So what they needed was a nationalized industry, privatized to pay for it, you needed a bank, and that's it. Uh, I think uh, Abramovich is not the most well-known of them. I think there is one that stayed back in USSR or in Russia now. But there were uh, several of them. If I say Khodorkovsky, you never heard of him. Mikhail. Huh? He was, in fact, trying to buy the Norwegian Kvarner Group. Why is he so known? He's in jail, or was in jail until, I think it was in December, wasn't it? He uh, stood up against Putin and yeah? didn't go so well. But he was uh, uh, sentenced for uh, tax evasion. So it was, in fact, put in, into court and sentenced for tax evasion. I mean, if you are in Russia, you have a big firm, owns a billion of dollars. It's hard to avoid tax evasion. So he was not the only one, but he was challenging Putin. So promise me that. You have the firm, you have Augsburg. Stay in Augsburg. Don't go back to uh, the home country. I think uh, Kudukovsky had moved to either Switzerland or is it Germany? Germany. Switzerland. Germany, okay. I, think. I think it's Germany, yeah. But if he's trying to buy Augsburg, go to the news media and say, this is my club, don't let him buy it. <laughs> is that a fair deal? Okay, then we say so. Yeah. So, do if you can guarantee that you have a financial working system, so no bank will go bankrupt, no default can be handled, 
then you can have a more stable development. So you need a bankruptcy law. You need legal institutions that can handle disputes like that. And it ended in the Asian catastrophe in 1997. And if I look around, I don't think any of you have heard of it. Okay, then you will hear of it very quickly. All economic wonders can come to an end. So they did in Asia in 1997. It actually happened on July the 2nd, two days before the National Day of US. So it is easy to remember. Yep. It led to the breakdown of Asian economies that had been growing up till 1997. So if you wonder if any wonder can go and move into heaven, the answer is someday it will end. Asian wonder ended in July 2nd, 1997. There were spillovers to Russia. Why are there spillovers from Asia to Russia? They are neighbors and they are connected. Yeah, so there were close links to Russia. Result of the financial openness, spillovers hard to avoid and might come in the future. So where will it come from in the future? I'm afraid the answer is China. If China collapses, at least Asia will be uh, having problems. Why could China collapse or Chinese economy collapse? Then we knew, go back to the painting. There are too many here trying to move over there. These need houses. There are a lot of houses there, but not enough money to pay for them. So that can be one of the collapses of Chinese economy. There are too many houses available, but at a very high price. Have you heard that story before? Yeah? They have these big ghost towns where no one lives. Yeah? No yeah. And if you had been in Spain, no. You could have very good house offers in part of Spain. Why didn't anyone buy these houses? Because the financial crisis in 2008 was uh, when most people were spending uh -huh. money instead of uh, buying houses in Spain. And there were a lot of houses around this house, but no one inside. And who would love to live in a place with a lot of houses and no one else but you there? Then you have to be Hitchcock and fond of very, let's say, dramatic uh, <coughs> American thrillers. So you can walk from an empty house to an empty house and see, is there anything happening now? And what happens is a disaster. So yes, it can be like Spain. Many houses available, no one have the money to buy it. The bank has already financed it. And if no one is buying the house that the bank now owns, then we are in Iceland. But you never asked. So in Iceland in 2009, there were a lot of people from Iceland that could not longer uh, pay back their loans. Who would buy them? No one. So how can you solve a problem where there are people in the houses that they are not able to pay for is unlike in Spain. They can still live there, but not pay for them for a short, shorter period. So they did stay there. But it's much nicer to walk around in a Reykjavik area where there are people in the other houses. So you cannot walk into an empty building and looking for the next disaster because there are uh, the same neighbors as it was yesterday. So that is the difference. So China can have the problem of Spain, a lot of houses built, financed by the bank, no one will buy them. I'm not sure if it's going to collapse 
But if it has collapsed, it will be four we meet in 10 years. So then we can discuss it. But till then, we still think that China can solve their problem. But they should, should be more careful. OK? Other risks are exchange rate problems, banking problems, reforms that should have been in place but are not yet, or contagion. But these problems, I think, China still can handle. They have a modern a sound political system. They have a legal system. In addition, they have corruption, but don't mention that in this case, because that is maybe not important. OK? So the problems can be there, even for the big economy like China. But it can be handled if you had been there before and said, remember the legal institutions. The laws must be in place. OK. Why are the problem of developing if you are, let's say, East Timor? Well, you are on your way to be developed, so all of them are trying to develop. Two, most of them have a large agriculture sector of one simple reason. And this is, do you remember the beginning of the story when he compares Chicago to San Francisco? and explain why is there big urban areas around Chicago a hundred years ago, like it is a big urban area in Los Angeles now, is simply because you need fresh services and food in the place. What are the most fresh you need if you are a human being? Food. Who can produce food for you if you are not fishing the agriculture sector? So all of these economies need fresh food. They need an agricultural sector. The problem is they are not earning enough money to generate development. There are few trading sectors. People live by producing food in the west of China. They are not producing anything that would be traded. And you know what barter is? So they change goods by goods, no money involved. So that is a problem. We have what we in Mexico call an informal sector. In uh, uh, Colombia, we call it. Okay. Yeah, but it's drug. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a few economies with informal let's say, sectors. Are they part of the formal economy? And the answer is no. Where are the money in the informal sector? But you cannot get your hands on them. Uh, lack of income. So if you're not trading or working in an in industry where you're paid wages, you are not, have nothing to, <coughs> to buy things for. But if you ask me, and there is no Chinese watching, I think the income inequalities is the biggest problem in China. There are very few very rich, and the billion not very rich at all. And since there is a billion that is not very rich, and very few that are very rich, if this had been in Mao's time 100 years ago, that would have been a revolution. So that is their problem. The system, the political system, might be unstable. But they have the advantage of being part of the international market. But I'm afraid it will be harder. It will take longer time. It will indeed be more demanding than it has been up to now. It was easier for Norway to develop, because all we needed was French and British money. And there were not so many that demanded French and English money. So we got it. If you ask me if we deserve it, I think my answer is yes. You will probably be the opposite. But we got it. 
Now it's harder to get that money. And there are more struggling for that money. Since we are all living in democracies, I think it's important. Simply because it gives people a saying into the political system. So instead of going on strike and strike and strike, you can vote and vote and vote. So you have at least an alternative. And that might be an advantage. Then we are close to the end. Do you know what transparency is? Something that you can see through. We normally have a transparency that we show, but not this time. We could have done it. Okay, so you can see through it. Two, stronger banking system, access to credit, equity, so somebody are willing to invest into your uh, economy, producing something that can be traded if you specialize. <coughs> so then the economy can be more stable. If the economy is stable, it probably will grow. Uh, you lead a legal system, we agree upon that, before we go fishing on Monday. So if you have the legal system, you can deal with crisis. Or if you have a political system, you can deal with crisis. So if you don't like the prime minister, you can throw him out of the office. In France, they lose in local elections, so the president throws him out of the office. Isn't that correct? So unlike what we do here, you let the president do the job. So now you have changed to a different prime minister in France, haven't you? Yeah. So, but at least you have somebody to throw him out of the office if you are not satisfied with the work he's doing. Yep. There is an economic history that can explain the development, let's say, of Norway. There is also an economic geography which explains, let's say, the economy of areas. And then you can understand why EU is an economic geography area where there are links to the countries in Europe that has helped them develop. But there are no single geography, let's say, uh, characteristics that can explain this will be a developing area. So if we are living in, let's say, the Pacific, on the Pacific island, which is a developing country, we don't know how it could develop. But India is the exception. None of you have ever been to India. I have been invited to Madras, which is a nice place in, I think, central India. My wife says, if we can afford it one day, we have to go to Agra. And none of you know why we should go to Agra. Because there was a young prince, I think he was, who had a very nice young wife who died. And what does a very young prince do if he have a lot of money and a dead wife? He the Taj Mahal. Taj Mahal, one of the nicest temples in India. So see you at Taj Mahal. Then I will be sound and will have no wheelchair because I've been there, then I've been uh, cured for whatever problems I have. But India is the example of, let's say, there is nothing that says that a country with a lot of aboriginals or people living there before European immigrated, they can still develop. So there are no, let's say, sign, dem demographical signs that can exclude development. Okay, for those of you who want to read the conclusion on 686, I've copied it. So it's in bigger letters, so those with glasses can also see it. You see it? There it is. Yeah. Okay, but there are no clear-cut answer to what will generate development. 
There are no single nation you can pick out and say, this will be the most developed countries in 10 years' time. And then we are close to the answer. Different places, different answers. Different time, different answers. As I said, Norway was a developing country in 1910, 11, I think it was. Then this guy, Samaida, decided to use the air to withdraw the nitrogen. And now they have been extracting oil and gas. And if any of you can see a close link between oil and gas extraction and fertilizers of agricultural production, but they are linked. So with development, you can develop more industries. I think that is important. Accessible markets. So it's easier to develop if you are from Asia and China is the fastest growing economy because you are a neighbor. And then you remember the start of it. You trade more with your neighbors than any other country. We need somebody who will buy our export, should be developed. Japan produce private cars, not for the Japanese market, but for the European market. <coughs> for some countries like East Timor, the opportunities are quite slim. What you can produce is more wood, but they do already produce it in Brazil, and it's much more of it. You can go fishing, but the German and French students go to Norway, or go to Norway instead of to East Timor. I don't think it was a question of going to East Timor, but there are a lot of fishing opportunities in East Timor. So yes, they have a potential, but it's not very big. But this is the conclusion of any text that Krugman would write on this issue. Whatever you do, there is one answer that will help you start trading. Exploit your CA, comparative advantages. That will help you most. If you do that, you will specialize. So for all we know, when we meet, and have fish at the meeting, it will be East Timorian white fish, fresh brought in from the German airline company that has now specialized on white fish from East Timor to the northern part of Europe. And it's the most profitable industry ever since the development of the Volkswagen. So that's it. Development, like economic progress elsewhere in the world, benefits from trade. We need more, not less, international economics. If you pass your exam, we can rerun that phrase uh, in the middle of May. Is that OK? But we need more international economics, because we need more trade and both developed and developing country would gain from it. <laughs> then we meet on Wednesday, uh, the 30th of April, 12.01, probably in room B136, so we can start and end at the same spot. So then the ring is closed. Okay? Have a nice weekend. i see you on Monday. Here in the building, quarter to 12. Just mention to them on Sunday night. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Have a nice weekend. <laughs>